So, you know, I, mesh networks are trendy now um, because I think generally people are talking about decentralized internet more and more and what that means. But what I think is kind of funny about the discussion about a decentralized internet is that we're generally still assuming two things that I think we shouldn't, which is one is we're assuming connectivity and there's still a lot of places and or people who are you know disconnected. And moreover, we're talking about building a decentralized internet on generally centralized infrastructure, right? So, um, and I think part of the reason that is the case is because generally centralized connectivity can do pretty amazing things for us, amazing things for us every day. So you want to, you know, text or, you know, have a video conversation with someone halfway across the world, that heavy infrastructure lets you do that, right? And under a second, you can get through transoceanic, you know, cables, mobile sites, you know, all sorts of all sorts of things, all the way back, you know, to someone else's phone across the world. And I think that's part of why we don't think about decentralized connectivity that much. Uh, and you know, when you put that same infrastructure on top of a more local situation, so let's say you're in here and you're trying to text somebody who's who's outside waiting to come in, it doesn't make that much sense that you're still going through all these pipes, so to speak, right? And so, you know, I think, you know, of course, we also know that particularly in urban situations, uh, communications infrastructure is as burdened as anything else. So, you know, the more people are on the network, the worse the network is for everyone, right? And so how is that gonna scale as our, you know, planet becomes more and more urbanized? Uh, and of course, in extraordinary situations, probably a lot of you, if you were living in New York five years ago, experienced this. Uh, the biggest problem with centralized connectivity, it becomes more clear, which is that central point of failure problem. So um, all of a sudden, you know, you have a situation, of course, it doesn't happen every day yet. <laughs> um, but during Hurricane Sandy, 25% of people lost connectivity in the 10 state area affected by the storm. And in some cases, lost it for days, in other cases, for weeks. Right? So why is it that we have a communications infrastructure that tends to fail us when we need it most? Right? And you know, for me, five years ago, that also begged the question, why can't I create my own connectivity? Why can I only plug into it? And you know, this is a good moment to call out the fact that our phones are actually designed not to enable phone-to-phone -phone communication at any practical distance. Right? And I think everyone here would agree that the 20 or 30 or even 50 feet, if you're lucky that you get on Bluetooth, does not do that for you, right? Um, and you know, part of the reason for that, without getting too into the political economy of things, is that you know the people who make the phones are in business with the people who provide you know the service. And you know, there are three real mobile carriers in the U.S. and any other region or country. It's pretty much just as limited, if not more limited. And um, so, you know, but if we could permit ourselves to imagine that we can create a scalable, decentralized connectivity layer, what might that be really good at? And as it turns out, it would be precisely good at what centralized connectivity is not. So uh, it would be able to increase access, increase resiliency, and also because there's no top-down control, it would also ensure neutrality, right? So if we go back to this uh, you know, local situation that I showed earlier, right? it doesn't make that much sense if you're, all you're trying to do is text someone outside or even a few blocks away to go through all these pipes. Um, you know, if you could uh, establish that direct efficient link, that shortest distance between two points, that straight line, um, that would be pretty great, right? And if, you know, if every phone is a connection point, then you could also imagine that you could leverage all the connection points around you, uh, all the phones in this room, in this building, in the streets outside, and and beyond. And so, you know, if we could create a phone to phone, uh, to phone to phone to phone mesh network, uh, that would be a pretty valuable tool, I think, for you know local communications that could service entire communities and cities. Um, so, you know, of course, everyone here, <laughs> you're here at a meetup around mesh networks, you know this is a mesh network, but I want to very specifically talk about um, Manets. So Manets are mobile ad hoc networks. So a mesh network can be mobile, but uh, not the other way around. So a Manet is essentially something that enables mobility. And so in a Manet, uh, by definition, the network topology is always changing. Uh, a node is never in the same place. In fact, by definition, it's not in the same place again. And so it's just a much harder network architecture to work with. And that's what we are building at Gotenna. So uh, Manets have been around for a while, but for the most part, they're relegated to really expensive systems that, you know, if I had enough money, um, I could 
show you a really big system that is hard to use, guzzles a ton of power, and is really only accessible to special operations forces. And that's also how hard they are to use. You basically have to be trained at Quantico to know how to use them. And they cost, seriously, fully loaded, anywhere from $20,000 to $300,000, right? So it's really not accessible to everyone. It's not really like a democratic technology so far. Um, and so when we at Gotenna decided, um, after our experience during Hurricane Sandy, we want to build something that allows people to create a manet um, in a way that is easy to use and actually accessible. We had to decide on some core design principles, really because the laws of physics uh, otherwise would, we'd also end up with a $300,000 device. And so we decided uh, to build some, to focus on something that was really small, uh, low power, low cost, uh, long lasting in terms of battery life, and that could uh, transceive over pretty great distances. So not feet, um, but ideally blocks, if not miles, in other situations, even before it ever relayed. Um, and so as a company, what we're doing is we're building a really advanced MANIT protocols specifically focused on short burst data that can transmit over pretty great distances. That's what we're doing. You know, that, that's sort of where the core design principles um, landed us. And uh, about a month ago, we started shipping our newest device, uh, which is this little thing here called Gotenna Mesh. Um, that you know costs under 100 bucks. <laughs> it just pairs to your phone, and it creates the first uh, Manit consumer-ready network. And so this is an entirely mobile mesh network. Uh, in under a minute, you pair it to your phone, and you can communicate peer-to-peer -peer and peer-to-peer-to-peer. -to -peer -to -peer. So you can privately and automatically route messages through anyone else who also, know, who also has one. And what's also pretty cool is it doesn't have to be paired to a phone. You can also drop, drop them in a breadcrumb fashion and create stationary relay notes. Um, and that's pretty cool as well. But so what I think is really interesting about unlocking this, you know, your phone, in a sense, right? We, we talked about how uh, phones, by definition, are not designed to enable peer-to-peer -peer communication. What this does is really leverage the infrastructure that's already there and unlocks it. And as more and more people, there's three and a half billion people with smartphones today, um, as more and more people have phones, uh, you know, you can leverage the growth and turn it into an asset as opposed to a liability in terms of like network scaling. Uh, and also what's pretty cool about creating an entirely parallel form of communication is that, yes, it's available when nothing else is, but it can also extend whether you want to call it the first mile or the last mile. It can also augment existing um, communication networks and just extend the practical edge of connectivity. So, you know, what we might imagine is, is I think, what a lot of us probably here hope for, which is that you can connect, um, you can actually really create a decentralized internet by connecting mesh to mesh, right? And so the kind of mesh network that we're building at Gotenna is very specific, of course, but it can augment other systems and you know backhaul into different things as well. So you can also free up the centralized pipes to do what they do well. So if you want to FaceTime someone halfway across the world, use the pipes. You want to text somebody across Manhattan, maybe just go through three other people on the way there, right? Um, and I think that's pretty powerful. Uh, and we can really start to conceive of a future where you might really be able to create the connectivity that you need at any time that you need it. But um, you know, we've been working on this for five years. Uh, we released our first product that did not mesh um, while we got the meshing product ready. Uh, so we had a Manit product, it was not a Manit mesh. Now we have a Manit mesh product. Um, but you know, what we are learning is that there's a lot of questions and a lot of research problems that affect any mesh network, uh, whether it's ours or anyone that you guys might be working on. And so, you know, how do you scale a mesh network? So just a little context on like where we are today. So uh, we just launched Gotenna Mesh a month ago, right? Uh, thousands of people uh, already bought it um, or pre-ordered it and some are still receiving them. But this is what our mesh network map, this is a self-reported map. Uh, shows uh, showed this morning. So this is how many people and how many different nodes in the United States specifically um, are being used. And if you zoom in to New York City, in the New York City area generally, this is how many there are. It's pretty cool. Uh, and if you filter out the people who have, have set up stationary relay nodes, you know, there's a lot fewer, right? But that's how it looks. That's how it looks today. And so, you know, so how do you scale it? This is what we're doing, and I'll specifically talk about New York because this is NYC Mesh. Um, you know, for one thing, for instance, in addition to all the people who are buying devices, we've actually um, earned a grant uh, from the city and the federal government. Uh, it's a resiliency grant, and we're going to be distributing over 20,000 Gotenna Mesh units to people in the low-lying areas of the city in the FEMA-designated 100-year floodplain. That's pretty cool. So we're going to be able to 
give out 20,000 devices uh, that people can use both on their own person as well as to set up relay nodes. So, you know, the map that I just showed before of New York City will be, de you know, denser with 20,000 more soon. Uh, you know, of course, we hope that we can integrate with other existing community Wi-Fi networks. So, you know, through um, backhaul, we can interconnect uh, into, you know, the global networks, right? Uh, so we have those plans. But, you know, I think that what we've started to learn is that when you ask how do you scale a mesh network, you're really asking a lot of other questions. And so, you know, this is a list of just some of the questions that anyone who is working on any kind of uh, mesh communication network, whether it's stationary as most are, or mobile, is you have everything from zero start problems. So how do you, you know, incent participation before it's, you know, useful at scale? Coverage, um, for as magical as meshing is, it's not that magical if there's not the nodes in between to get you to where you're trying to get to, right? Also, how do you make sure that you have the capacity you need, where you need it, when you need it, to handle all sorts of different kinds of uh, traffic? volumes of traffic. Uh, and of course, we also have to deal with power. Um, unlike other communications networks, mesh networks require not just your own power, but those of others, right? So how do you incent the sharing of energy resources? And spectrum, a spectrum is finite. So whether you're working on like 2.4 gigahertz or 5.1 gigahertz, or in our case, we're working on 900 megahertz, uh, the public spectrum on that end, that is also a finite spectrum, a finite resource that is moreover regulated by the government. So you know, how do you incent fair use of a shared limited resource, right? And because by definition, uh, mesh networks are local networks, they're community networks, how do you incent the bridging of the global communications gap? How do you incent people to put up those bridges, that backhaul, that gateway into everything else, right? And so um, the question, I think, of how to scale mesh networks actually becomes how do you incent participation and fair use um, in that decentralized network, whether it's mobile or off-grid or it's on-grid and static. You, you're, all these questions um, you, you have to think about when you're building your protocol and you know giving it the functionality that, that you do. So for instance, we have artificially constrained our product today uh, to focus on short bursts in part because you know I don't have $50 billion to go buy white space, right? And if we let everyone transmit all the time, then it would easy, very quickly become just a crappy walkie-talkie system, right? So you know how can we build um, incentives and behavior into the protocol itself so that we don't actually have to artificially constrain it, right? And uh, but because people are selfish and not like always logical also, you know, you have to think about this pretty hard. And so what we're doing and what I'd like to invite anyone or everyone in this room to collaborate with us on is we are starting to work on a non-proprietary protocol layer that will help address a lot of these uh, scarcities and coordination issues in any mesh network. And the point is to create a, a protocol layer that can help any and all mesh networks, not just ours, scale and address this so that it's built into you know, the way the, the networks are used themselves. Uh, and so you know, I invite you guys to uh, sign up to learn about our mesh SDK, which will be available later this month. So very easily integrate into anything that you're building. Um, email me directly. We also have a, a public message board where we're discussing things like this. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty much it. I, I think there's time for Q&A, right, Brian? Uh, hi, thanks for the presentation. I was just wondering how much the device was is being currently being sold for. Um, it's two for 179, and it gets progressively cheaper the more devices you buy. Um, so it's basically one for 85 bucks at the most expensive. And what we're finding is that over 50% of people who bought for a ton of mesh have bought four or more. So they, they're buying it with this idea of at least creating a little network with their neighbors, their family, their friends, right? But what's pretty exciting is if you look at, you know, I'll go back to just, just like how this looks already, these people didn't buy it together, right? But in a way, we created this map on mymeshu.com so that people can actually visualize it's something that's otherwise invisible, right? And you know, what we, my hope is that we can, in the not too distant future, be selling them one at a time. But we don't want anyone to have like a crappy experience of being like, I bought one and there's no one near me. But I think with time, it's going to happen. I think a lot sooner than we expected um, because because people are buying. Uh, Many of them, and particularly in urban areas, you know, you can see here in the map of the United States, you know, if you zoom in further, it's Miami, it's the major cities in Texas, it's all the big cities on the East Coast, um, you know, all, Toronto, Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, it's slam, right? Um, 
And then it's free to use after you're three five months. Hi. Um, thank you. The uh, original unit operated on the MURS frequencies, correct? Okay. Yeah. And now the next, the second generation is on 900? Correct. Okay. Yeah, the second generation product works on the ISM civilian band and it'll tune to different frequencies and emitted power based on the region that you're in. So here we like conform to what the FCC makes available in like the CE region, region it's like. Okay. And might your organization have plans of developing a product that could plug and play into, for example, a Balfine? You know what that is? A mm -hmm. Balfine? Okay, yeah. something like that. Therefore, uh, users could use, whether licensed or un not unlicensed frequencies, what, similar to MERS, or if they have their own frequency allocations, or if they're amateur radio operators. We have, we have a kind of pro line coming out at the end of the year that it's intended for licensed sector users. So that works throughout UHF and VHF. It is intended specifically for like public safety, industrial, and, and other like government uses. And that has, that has variable power to five watt, obviously variable power for the spectrum. But you have to at least sign up the liability that you have access to the license. I, I think so it already exists. And in addition, we're uh, coming out with a harder SDK version of that product. So if you want to put it into a drone or anything else, you know, you can do that. So that last item you mentioned yeah. does not have a transceiver. The SDK? No, no, it has a whole like. Okay, because what I'm what I'm driving at is yeah. something where I have the transceivers. Um, I need I need your controller of sorts for Basically an existing network, radio. Like smarts? I don't know what that is. Just like the firmware and the network protocols is sort of what you're looking at. I mean, eventually we'll I want a box that I can plug into the speaker microphone connector. Now I have a mesh network uh, device. I mean, our protocol is specific, like it's very, um, like it won't work on other hardware. Not yet. Not until like, we made a version of the network protocol as we like, learn more that can like work on other hardware. But, like, so not yet, but that doesn't mean that, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't mean that we wouldn't like to. So, you know, we, we started, you know, our first product already had an open SDK on the software side, mesh will be in a few weeks. We have a hardware SDK coming out there. I mean, we want to create a system that's as open and as useful to the people as possible. With that so, hardware SDK, what kind of a price are we looking at um, per unit? We are literally Guestimate? in the process of making it, but the idea is to make it accessible for people to be able to develop Not it. just people with federal grants, Correct. public safety, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. We would make that available to like the developer community at large. Very nice, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, does it mean it's a voice or is it a yeah. voice? Show? Do you want to get next? Oh, that's, that's a good question. Um, so it's actually, uh, as I mentioned before, we uh, are focused on short burst data. Does it mean that we couldn't do persistent voice or any other high bandwidth communication? Um, the, but because we're working on limited license spectrum, we are making the most efficient use of it possible. And so we've decided to focus on short burst data. And so what you get for giving up high bandwidth is you get really great propagation. And so in a city like New York, sometimes you can get like a quarter of a mile, half a mile, just point to point before you can mesh. Right? In the outdoors, you can be getting four miles, 10 miles, and put it on a drone before you can mesh again. And so what we're, what we're giving up is voice, but what we're getting back is like better coverage with less wow. notes. So again, that's part of why we're interested in building probably like a blockchain-like protocol layer that like lives higher above the, the communication transport layer that um, will allow us to like open up the, net, the the protocol more. But if we open it up today, anyone who would use it the second someone decides I want to try to stream Netflix, you know, over many packets would, would ruin it for everyone else. Right. So that's that whole idea of how do we communally incent participation, but also the fair use of a shared resource. Yeah, the bottom-up stuff has its own. Can I ask, um, what about the CBRS 3.5? Are you planning to use that? As, what is it, sir? Citizens Broadband Radio Service oh. 3.5. Oh, the ham? Is that the ham? No, it's a new thing that the FCC set it up. So our product, our, uh, the core RF hardware that we create is technically modular, but we would have to like create a new version for each frequency, and we get emails every day. Can I suggest you look? You look. You, can I suggest you look at this because they just produced a whole new bunch of unlicensed spectrum? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure our team knows more about it. Well, okay. We have a map of our, like a spectrum okay. uh, map outside my office, actually. Um, yeah, I mean, the point is we'll make it wherever there is need. Um, 
but it would have to be demonstrated for us to do. But that's also hopefully why, as we open more things to software and hardware, people can build their own things. We don't want to build everything. We're focused, like really, we're a portable company. We're just making hardware because it's not. Okay. Cool. All right. Thank, Thank you. you.